Most people when they drive by a cornfield don't think much about it or realize what a powerhouse it is. It was not that long ago when corn did not seem to have that bright of a future. Back in the 1920s, the average yield for corn was around 20 bushels per acre. Today, common yields are around 200 bushels per acre, and in really good years, bushels can push beyond 250 bushels per acre. That is a tenfold increase from the 1920s. No other crop can make such a claim and yield jump. The modern corn plant is the king at converting energy from the sun compared to other crops grown in the U.S. It doubles the yields of wheat, has three to four times more yield than soybeans. It can produce roughly 1.5 times more dry matter than alfalfa and grasses. Most of this dramatic yield can be attributed to hybridization. Corn responds to hybridization unlike any other. But what is hybrid, hybridization and how does it work? The simple definition of hybridization is a crossing of two unrelated lines to produce offspring that are a combination of the two parents. This is probably best illustrated by thinking about dog breeding. Purebred dogs, or breeds as they are commonly called, are created through inbreeding, breeding them to closely related relatives over several generations until each new generation is pretty much a copy of their parent. This is done to lock in desired traits. The golden retriever, for example, is prized for its golden coat, excellent hunting nose, and sunny disposition. Dogs that do not show these traits are not bred to make sure that the desired quantities continue in the breed. The problem with inbreeding is that in addition to locking in desirable traits, you have a higher chance of locking in undesirable qualities or issues. Golden retrievers can have more joint problems and tend to shed. Hybridization comes into dog breeding when you start crossing two different breeds to hopefully combine the best parts of the two breeds. A good example of this is the golden poodle cross or commonly called the golden doodle. Here you have the sunny disposition for the golden side and non-shedding intelligence from the poodle side and arguably a prettier dog than either of the parents. The same process is being used in corn hybridization but with the corn you see a much stronger expression of heterosis or hybrid vigor. Simply put, the initial offspring of the two inbred lines are much stronger in productive plants than their parents. Inbred lines that would normally yield 40 to 100 bushels per acre have offspring that can produce 200 to 270 bushels per acre when crossed with the unrelated inbred line. This hybrid vigor is what drives the seed industry and delivers the big yields farmers bank on. Hybrid vigor is what I consider more the black magic portion of hybridization. To understand this, we must look a little deeper into the genetic code. Each cell in a plant or animal, except for reproductive cells, has a complete set of genes. Genes contain the recipe for the cells to produce certain proteins. These proteins are used both within the cell and by other cells to dictate certain behaviors, what we generally refer to as traits. All genes are not created equal. Some do a better job or cause a more positive response than others that are located in the same spot. The goal of all breeding is to accumulate as many favorable genes in your hybrid as you can. Making this more difficult is that in most species, each gene is made up of two parts that only one part will randomly transfer into the next generation. Let's start with a short illustration of how genes transfer. As I just stated, each gene is made up of two parts. In our illustration, we will use two letter A's to represent the gene. An uppercase A signifies that the half that, that half is expressing, while a lowercase A shows that the gene is not expressing. Normally, if you have either half expressing, then the gene is turned on and working. When the plant or animal is crossed with another parent, the offspring randomly takes one half of each parent's gene and combines them to create its own gene that may or may not express. 
in this example, if the uppercase A is taken from the first parent's gene, you will have an uppercase A, lowercase A, which means you have a gene expression. However, if the lowercase A is used from the first parent's gene, it's always going to result in a lower A, lower A gene, which means the gene is turned off. So in this example here, there's only a 50% chance that the gene is active. The only way we can guarantee gene expression is if we have two uppercase pairs in one of the two parents, like we see here. In this case, you're always going to have an upper A, lower A combination in the offspring, which makes the gene active. Let's illustrate some of this using dog breeding as the example. For as many different types of dogs there are, surprisingly only a few genes are involved with creating this large variation. A dog's fur is determined by three genes for length, curl, and trimmings, with eight genes involved in color. Here is a a golden retriever's fur genes mapped out. The long coat gene active along with two colored genes to produce the golden color. When you breed a golden retriever with another golden retriever, the mapping does not change. The genes that are active stay active as they are uppercase A on both sides, and the genes that are not active remain the same. Thus, the golden retriever offspring will have a long straight golden coat like its parents. If you were to cross the golden retriever with a poodle, the offspring's coat will be different. The poodle's curly coat will come through as it becomes a big A, little a gene. The long hair remains and the color can produce multiple variations as poodles were not primarily selected for the color and can have varying degrees of gene expression. When we look at corn, we are trying to make hybrid whose inbred genes complement each other. In this example, we have six known yield genes mapped out. Inbred 1 has dominant expression in 2, 5, and 6, while inbred 2 has dominant expression in 3, 4, and 6. The offspring is then guaranteed to have expression in 2 through 6, better than either of the parents. Using a simplistic scoring system, the offspring would be at 5 positive genes to 3 for the parents. What keeps us seed companies in business is that this yield expression is the strongest in the first generation offspring. If you were to take the offspring and let it self-pollinate or cross with itself, then the uppercase A, lowercase a genes would start creating lowercase a, lowercase a inactive genes in its own offspring. On average, it would generate a 4 rating on our rating scale and could be as low as 1. The only way to guarantee that 5 rating every year is to use the first generation seed created by crossing the inbred lines. Ideally, if we could come up with a corn variety that had uppercase A, uppercase A expression in all critical genes, then we would no longer need to hybridize corn. However, this is a case of real world and ideal world being not quite aligned. Rink Seeds' Dr. Rick Batty explains some of the hurdles we have in getting to the perfect corn plant. The hard portion of breeding um, is, is sheer numbers of genes that are controlling the different traits. I think they've pretty well identified that there's 35 to 40,000 genes there, which is rather amazing because it's, it's almost twice as many as in the human body. Um, there's roughly 250 genes in the corn genome that have some impact on, on yield, as an example. Um, now, it's been defined that there's, there's roughly only about 20 clusters of these that uh, have a major impact. So if we're able to focus just on 20, you know, it's still a very difficult thing to accumulate all the best of those 20 into one hybrid. So why is 20 so difficult? It is not a large number. The problem is that the likelihood of getting all 20 expressing as uppercase A, uppercase A, or what we call dominant, is daunting to say the least. Even if we were to start the self-pollinating with all 20 of these genes at uppercase A, lowercase A, we would still only have 25% of the offspring at uppercase A or uppercase A or dominant for each gene. 
probably the best way to put it is that 25% of the offspring will have gene 1 dominant. Of those 25%, only 25% of those will have gene 2 dominant. Of those with gene 1 and gene 2 dominant, only 25% of those will have gene 3 dominant. By the time we get to gene 4, it is hard to even express that probability as a percentage. 4 tenth of a percent. Instead, we could look at it as a chance per number of offspring that the number of genes are locked. Gene 1 will be dominant in 1 out of 4 offspring, but gene 1 and 2 being dominant will only happen in 1 out of 16 offspring. For all 20 being dominant, the chance is 1 out of more than 1 trillion for that to happen. Even if you were to get these 20 genes dominant, your work would not be done. You still have standability, disease resistance, and other traits to worry about. In addition, certain environments favor certain gene combinations. One gene package does not work best from the Canadian border down to the Gulf of Mexico. New DNA techniques and fingerprinting are shining a light on the inner workings of corn hybrids and are accelerating the drive to the ultimate corn plant. I don't see hybrids disappearing anytime soon, but we are seeing a quickening in new and better hybrids coming to the market. This comes at a good time as we are seeing demand for corn both as food source and an energy source rapidly increasing.